We have to understand that in rabbinic sources, uh, Ruach HaKodesh, in some discussions, refers to quite a low-level form of inspiration, of prophetic inspiration, even sub-prophetic inspiration, that somehow is even uh, available uh, after the main forms of prophecy cease to exist. So when people, when rabbis talk about Ruach HaKodesh, they have a kind of uh, ambiguous understanding of what this means. On the one hand, it means a kind of inspiration, but in other sources in the rabbinic world, Ruach HaKodesh actually refers to God's being. Mm -hmm. it's, a kind of, uh, it's a kind of person of God. And so Ruach HaKodesh kind of screams and talks in the name of God, or it's even an embodiment of the Torah and God. So you can say that there's a tension already in classic Judaism between Ruach HaKodesh as God's being, and that's somehow much closer to the Christian understanding, I think, and Ruach HaKodesh is somehow something that exists inside man as a kind of inspiration, a prophetic or even sub-prophetic inspiration that somehow gives him power, or gives him, it's e sometimes even considered non-Jews can reach uh, this kind of, you know, it kind of gives you a temporarily uh, access to God's mind or access to God's power. Now, this tension continues into medieval Jewish thought because uh, Maimonides, for example, thinks about Ruach HaKodesh as inspiration. But what he does is associates the term Ruach HaKodesh with this uh, basic worldview of noetic or metaphysical over overflow. That means this is the first stage where Ruach HaKodesh is associated now with a fundamental new idea that comes into Judaism that's absorbed from outside. This the whole general uh, metaphysical worldview that sees not only that, you know, not only structures a theology and a metaphysics, but realizes that this metaphysics is an energetic kind of structure that overflows energy from the higher realms to the lower realms. And that's something that's shared by all the grand theories that Judaism is uh, synthesizing in medieval Judaism. That's both Neoplatonism, Neo-Aristotelism, and Hermetic, uh, Hermetic kind of forms of thought where it's astral power uh, descending. So what happens is they associate Ruach HaKodesh with this metaphysical power. Now this is not God. This is not the Word of God. This is not communication with God. On the contrary, it's something lower. It's created energy. It's sub-divine energy. But still, there's a movement from just saying that it's some kind of inspiration of man to association of this term with something metaphysical or ontological. The next stage in Kabbalah, and here is the big move, the big step, is the association of Ruach HaKodesh with the divine energy. And here you turn, we're actually returning to the ancient idea that the Ruach HaKodesh is God's being. And now you're saying, look, when you're saying that someone has received Ruach HaKodesh, you're not saying something, ah, so he had some kind of inspiration. You're saying, no, you're saying now that the divine being is dwelling inside of him. So we're talking about something that's much more advanced, a much more radical mystical understanding of this Ruach HaKodesh. What they do for Shabbat is this phenomenon. I mean, they're doing something amazing. Their Shabbat exists before, obviously, Kabbalah. And, and what Kabbalah does with Shabbat is it, it interprets not only the ideas of Shabbat, but the entire ritual of Shabbat, the entire understanding of Shabbat, the, all the prayers of Shabbat, all the practices of Shabbat are receiving now a new meaning. They say Shabbat is a kind of time where we're somehow elevated into a different realm. And this is already an outcome of, what, of, the, of a process that's happening above in the Godhead. And fundamentally, what happens in the Godhead is a union, a union between God and the Jewish people, a union between the masculine and the feminine. There's a harmony, there's an elevation, and a kind of uh, uh, understanding that Shabbat is really the time where the, Jew, the Jewish people and God have a day in which they unite in which there's a harmony, and the spirit, one of the manifestations of the state in the Godhead 
is that the people of Israel are embodied by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the life of the Godhead. And in order to be able to receive the light or the Spirit, you have to have an intimate connection with God, an ongoing, intense communion or cleaving or integration into the Godhead. Now what happens on Shabbat, when they talk about Shabbat, they're talking collectively. So somehow, as a collective, it just happens. And you have one, and, and people receive it somehow collectively, and then it goes away. If you're the people that are interested in a much more spiritual or mystical, intense life, the way to receive the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, on a permanent basis, is to live a very intense mystical and spiritual life through the Jewish way of life, through the halacha, through the performance of the commandment, through the study of the Torah, through different spiritual techniques. And when it goes into the 16th century, they say, look, you have to work, this is a very intense personal path where you have to become purified, vessel, what they call a chair or throne, for the divine to be able to dwell in you. So this is a very intense process of, uh, of both uh, religious performance, religious, uh, you know, performing all the rituals, all the commandments, a life of Torah. You study Torah all day, a life, you know, a life of purification, of uh, some forms of asceticism, depends on each, there's different kind of paths for this. But the, the basic idea is, that if a person is driven strong enough, he can incorporate himself into the Godhead. And that's, that's Kabbalah. Kabbalah is all about how a person can cleave, integ integrate himself into the Godhead. And then once he does that, then the second wave is the God dwells back into him and completes this process.